the Sure Investing Podcast, investments and strategies to help you safely compound your wealth over the long run. The Sure Investing Podcast is hosted by Nick McCollum and supported by Sure Dividend, an investment newsletter provider aimed at helping people invest better through low-cost, long-term positions in individual securities. All opinions expressed by Nick and podcast guests are solely their own opinions and do not necessarily reflect the opinions of Sure Dividend. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon as a basis for investment decisions. For more information about Sure Dividend and the research our firm provides, go to www.suredividend.com forward slash research. Today, I am thrilled to be interviewing Brad Thomas, the editor of the Forbes Real Estate Investor publication and a senior research analyst for iRead. Brad researches and writes on a variety of real estate-based fixed income alternatives, including publicly listed real estate investment trusts. Brad is the co-author of The Intelligent Read Investor, How to Build Wealth with Real Estate Investment Trusts. His investment universe includes approximately 100 U.S. equity REITs, mutual funds, and REIT ETFs. In this interview, we discuss Brad's due diligence process for REIT investing, the differences between equity REITs and mortgage REITs, and Brad's new book, The Trump Factor, Unlocking the Secrets Behind the Trump Empire. Stay tuned for more. So Brad, I just wanted to begin by giving you a hugely warm welcome and thanks for being interviewed on the Sure Investing Podcast. You're known on Seeking Alpha and elsewhere as an expert on real estate investment trusts or REITs for short. For our beginner listeners, I was curious if you could give an explanation of what is a REIT and why investors should consider an allocation to REITs in their investment portfolio. Sure. Well, th- and thanks for letting me be on your show today. So a REIT, of course, is a real estate investment trust and REITs were formed in 1960. So uh, over five decades of of uh, history that we can point to uh, in the in the REIT space. REITs come in many shapes and sizes. Over the last several years, we've seen a number of real estate products that have uh, made their way to the REIT sector that you normally wouldn't think of as, as real estate. So for example, we now have data center REITs. Uh, we have cell tower REITs. We have prison REITs. We have practically any any type of product that can be defined as real estate. Now, we, we've seen that, those, those uh, types of businesses so it's it's a it's a very broad sector, uh, over a trillion dollars in the U.S. in, in uh, market capitalization, and so I think that's a big big part of the the, the sales pitch for REITs is just these companies uh, ha- offer diverse categories of property sectors uh, across the country, and some of the REITs invest in the U.S., some of them invest in the U.S. and and internationally as well, and we also have commercial mortgage REITs as well as residential mortgage REITs. So it's a it's a it's a growing sector. One of the one of the I guess the big uh, laws related to REITs is that they must pay out at least ninety percent of their taxable income in the form of dividends. Most equity REITs pay out a hundred percent, and so that makes them uh, higher dividend paying stocks compared to their uh, other dividend paying C corporations or other stocks. So I think that you know the higher dividend yields is really part of the attraction. And of course, REITs are publicly traded, so the, the, the fact that they're liquid and offer the ability to uh, sell, buy and sell shares every day. As I said, it's a trillion-dollar proven asset class, so there's no problem when you want to sell a share, you can uh, immediately get your principal. Also, last year, actually two years ago, 2016, REITs were at one time housed under the financials pillar, if you will, under the S&P index, or that we call the JICs. And now, uh, as of October 2016, REITs uh, really moved into their own new pillar of real estate. So, so what this really means is that REITs are not an alternative asset class. Uh, they're now validated based on the fact that S&P categorizes REITs as their own uh, universe, if you will. And so uh, it, it really has forced a number of, of uh, financial planners, advisors, and investors to really understand this, the REIT space because it is a uh, it is a core uh, food group, as I like to say. Uh, I will say one last thing. Um, uh, give myself a plug. My co-author and I wrote a book uh, in late 2016 called "The Intelligent REIT Investor" that was published along with our uh, Wiley and Forbes. And that book has sold uh, quite well. In fact, I found out just a few days ago that we have the book now translated in China, and so uh, we, there's a lot of demand in Asia for the for the REIT product as well. So. Uh, you can find that book on Amazon. Awesome. So tell us about the book. That was actually one of the questions I had written down to talk about later. Now that it's up in the conversation, I'd love to hear more about the book. Sure. So uh, again, I have a co-author, Stephanie Cruz and Kelly, and she's great. She's got uh, a lot of experience in in REITs and in real estate. She's been a sell-side analyst. Uh, prior to that, she was a, uh, a Wharton graduate. 
And uh, now she is the head of investor relations at uh, one, actually one of the REITs I cover called Corporate Office Properties Trust, ticker symbols OFC. But Stephanie and I decided that, uh, you know, there was a big demand for this, for a, a book like this that was, it was educational, but also could be utilized in the classroom. And so this book is really aimed for, for not only individual investors, retirees or pre-retirees, really anyone that wants to understand REITs, but also we, we, may, we take it a little bit more granular in the later chapters of the book. And we actually have that book in a number of classrooms now. Uh, around the country. In fact, uh, some of the some of the highest ranking real estate schools in the country, like Georgetown University, uh, NYU, uh, and others, now utilize this uh, this book uh, in the classroom. So it's been very well received, and we're I was grateful that uh, Marty Cohen, who was the co-founder of Cohen and Steers, one of the largest re- fund managers in the world, uh, also wrote the foreword for the book. So we're really excited. And and as I said last week, we just had that book translated in in uh, in China. So I'm very excited. I'm actually going to China here uh, in the next couple of months. So I'm really anxious to visit the country, but also uh, talk to some investors about REITs. The title of the book is The Intelligent REIT Investor. And it obviously looks like it was inspired by Benjamin Graham's The Intelligent Investor. Is that the case or am I misreading this? No, that's absolutely spot on. I mean, I, uh, you know, really part of my investing strategy, if you will, if you've read any of my articles, is I've Certainly consider myself a a value investor. I'm 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 the opposite of a of a market timer, and so we pay very close attention, uh, as I'm sure you do as well, with your with your line of work and underlying fundamentals of companies, and really trying to uh, to dissect each individual security to determine uh, the appropriate value or margin of safety. So of course, when Ben Graham was around. Uh, REITs, as I said, were were formed in 1960, so he was still alive. But when he wrote his book, uh, which is in the in the 1920s, the Intelligent Investor, uh, obviously the REIT structure, at least as it exists in the U.S., was not was not available. So quite simply, I mean, REITs provide the individual investor access to institutionally held real estate, and applying that same value investing strategy to our business is is really uh, been successful for us. And, and that's why I titled the book that way. Graham's book, The Intelligent Investor, talks about how to value securities based on fundamentals like the price to earnings ratio, the price to book ratio. You know, the lower, the better, the lower those metrics, the higher of a margin of safety you have. How would you compare analyzing C-Corps with those metrics versus the metrics that should be used to analyze REITs? The primary, well, there's, there's multiple differences. And again, that's that's one of the reasons I decided to write this book with Stephanie. But really, the, when you look at valuation, real estate is a little different when you when you compare real estate securities valuation with, with ordinary C-Corps or stocks. And that is that real estate has some some nuances that that the C-Corps don't, don't enjoy or don't have. Uh, they are certainly beneficial, but when it comes to valuing shares in a, in a REIT, uh, you really need to understand those differences. So the PE metric is is totally not necessary when it comes to REITs. I mean, earnings are critical for any company, as you know. But with with REITs, we we derive at a little different earnings metric to determine the you know, measure of cash flow that the company generates, and that really boils down to a number of things like depreciation, or capex, leasing fees. So in order, in order to derive at a at a pure measure of cash flow or earnings for REITs, we look at things like depreciation and CapEx and leasing costs, maintenance and other things to really determine what the actual you know, cash flow is out of these REITs or really out of the real estate. And obviously, then we look at how that translates into their dividend. And so I think looking at a company from a funds from operations metrics, which is commonly referred to as FFO, or adjusted funds from operations, which is not GAAP, by the way, but it's referred to as um, AFFO. And we utilize all of those metrics in the articles that, that I write and also that we have in our newsletter product as well. So I think those are, you know, when you, when you type in uh, Google or, or Yahoo Finance and you go look at a stock, generally you're not going to see the FFO or AFFO data. So that's what really inc- you know, important for investors to, uh, to recognize those earnings metrics. Another another different way that we value uh, REIT shares, uh, and I'm not as a big a proponent of this as, say, some of the institutional investors, uh, but that is the net asset value, or NAV, NAV. And that is, sim- is really um, much like uh, getting an appraisal on your home or on a commercial property. It's a sim- simply uh, taking a, uh, the, the, the uh, 
the assets off of the REIT balance sheet, subtracting out the debt uh, and other other uh, preferreds or what have you, and really arriving at a cost per share. Uh, really, what I would refer to as almost a liquidation value uh, for you know for the REIT, and so that's another um, uh, another way to to value. Uh, REITs. Again, I'm not as much a, uh, I won't say fan. NAV certainly sort of has its has its uh, purposes, and from time to time, you know, I'll do NAVs on 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 companies uh, like Ladder Commercial is a good example, which um, company that recently had a takeover offer, I guess you could say, and 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 a lot of investors wanted to know what the actual value of the company was if it was sold. So from time to time, I'll I'll um, I'll look at those. Uh, underlying valuations of those companies, um, and then I think the third metric, which is pretty common for most um, for most investors, is the dividend yield itself and how the how the yield compares uh, with the peer group uh, and with the sector, or the uh, REIT sector, and then overall. So I think usually when you see me go into a deep dive on on one particular stock or REIT, uh, I'll usually try to address the uh, you know the price to funds from operations. Uh, as well as the dividend yield, those are uh, kind of the primary indicators uh, of valuation. And again, from time to time, we'll look at the NAV if, if necessary. And would you say that your aversion to using NAV as a valuation metric is due to its reliance on external appraisals? No, um, I'll tell you, on the NAV, what I typically do is, you know, my background is in real estate, and I'm not an appraiser at all, but I usually, I do have a pretty good grasp on cap rates, and really, I, I should. That's part of my job. So, now, sometimes I'll rely on cap rates uh, from other analysts, but but I like looking at the individual properties uh, themselves because a, a, a lot of times you can't paint paint all the uh, you know properties by the same same brush. In other words, you know I like to break out um, if say for example it's a shopping center or a mall, I like to determine you know here you know maybe the A, B, and C buckets. So these are the highest quality um, you know shopping centers, and you would apply. You know, a cap rate on on that you know basket, and then the uh, same goes for the B basket and the C basket. So I like to I like to break down the various um, properties uh, because you know again each portfolio is not going to have all of the same um, you know ingredients. And so, um, but yeah, I mean I usually like to come up with my own cap rates using market market data uh, if at all possible. You talked about your preferred valuation metrics being price of funds from operation or price to adjusted funds from operations, and then the company's dividend yield. How would you say that funds from operations and adjusted funds from operations are different than gap earnings or adjusted earnings for investors who only have experience investing in equities? Sure. So I wrote an article in Forbes uh, a while back explaining the difference uh, in uh, funds from operations and adjusted funds from operations. Not all companies will report the AFFO metric because it's not, you know, gap. But uh, all companies do report the FFO metric. Really, the big difference here is that in an AFFO basis, uh, there's a f- couple other subtractions that you would look at to arrive at that that final number. Things such as capex, um, you know, and um, leasing fees. And so, for example, you know, you may have like an office building that just for round numbers generates, you know, a dollar per share, but in FFO. But say this company has a large number of move outs, uh, vacancies, and it has some have to reinvest uh, money back into to uh, br- bring a new tenant in. So it would cost money in terms of some some capex. And leasing, you have to pay leasing leasing brokers. So when you when you when you subtract out those numbers, and they're they're more, they're certainly lumpy because you don't know when those tenants are going to come and go. But that act, that that would pr- take out or subtract out uh, those expenses from your FFO to arrive at a pure you know, measure of funds, really funds available for distribution, which is another term we we use called FAD. Uh, we're putting together a glossary now of, of a, a lot of these terms because investors, it is really confusing. There are a number of, of of those confusing terms in the REIT space. But in terms of that, that's really AFFO is really the, the best metric to use uh, because it is the purest measure of cash flow per share. And you could when you compare that to your dividend payout, and let's say using that same example, that the office REIT has a dollar a share in FFO, but after uh, after these expenses, they're down, say, 20 cents to, uh, say, an 80 cent AFFO. Well, if the dividend is, say, 90 cents a share, then you can see that this company is paying over 100 percent 
of their uh, dividend uh, is paid out AFFO. So there's not enough real profit, actual earnings to pay or cover that dividend. So it's really important to drill down to the, you know, to the cash flow. FFO does a pretty good job because it really takes out depreciation, which is one of the big, I guess, uh, differences between pure regular earnings and funds from operations. But it's really important to really peel back the peel back the onion and de- determine which of these companies uh, pays out, you know, the the actual cash flow for the property itself. And when you do that, you can see a number of companies that may look um, they may look um, uh, safe. On, on the surface, but when you dig deeper and particularly taking a look at the AFFO metric and some of those expenses that I mentioned, then you'll see that there are um, there's some there's some potential uh, danger involved, and that's where we come up with the word sucker yield. And you may have seen that in some of my articles. I write on that quite a bit, but that's simply a a yield is too good to be true because nine times out of ten that uh, that company is not generating enough AFFO pure cash flow to cover its dividend. Do you have any examples of sucker yields in today's REIT market? Yeah, I just wrote on a couple last week. So one that comes to mind is New Senior, uh, ticker SNR. Now, we, we, we were a buyer of that, of that particular REIT a while back. It's, it is externally managed, uh, this company, and they're in the senior living space. But we've seen an erosion of, of earnings or, or F, FFO. You know, now the company is really close to 100% payout, and they're still declining, and the senior living model is – experiencing more of a, 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 a cyclical event in, in the healthcare space. And I think we're starting to see that come back to life. But this particular company, uh, New Senior, is one that's really tight. Another one that's tight is Washington Prime. Again, if you, that's WPG, uh, small uh, mall REIT. They also own a few shopping centers as well. But that company is uh, from an FFO basis. They're, they're not that bad, but from an AFFO uh, basis, they are getting tighter and have the highest payout ratio in the mall uh, peer space. A couple others that that really helped me, uh, got me away from 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 danger were um, a few years ago. I wrote on a company uh, called Wheeler, uh, which is a small shopping center based uh, based up in the uh, up in Virginia, and they've now cut their dividend twice. But you know they were almost chronically paying out more dividend than they could earnings. And so when you look at that payout ratio, that really is a pretty, pretty good indicator that the company could, uh, you know, could, could cut the dividend. And, and so we saw what happened in 2009 and, you know, really coming out of the recession, most, many of the REITs were forced to cut their dividends uh, during that period. So it's been really valuable for us to look at these companies since 2009 to see how they have uh, really managed that risk and hopefully not, uh, you know, cutting that dividend again. So again, the good thing about the REIT space is there is a lot of history that we can rely upon to determine kind of when the cycles are going to occur. And I'll also say that, you know, one of the things we do look at really closely is supply and demand uh, of the underlying real estate. Because when you look at these cycles, as I alluded to earlier with senior senior living, uh, but you can look at the, you know, kind of the the, the life cycle, if you will, of each of these property sectors, and that really gives you a pretty good indication of whether you want to you know, buy into those sectors now or not. And that's part of our strategy is we put together uh, tactical portfolio modeling is to really try to find the best um, sectors uh, to invest in now that have the best chances for continued um, earnings and dividend growth um, over time. Are there any sectors that particularly stand out to you as being really appealing in terms of earnings growth and dividend growth for the foreseeable future? Yeah, I think there is. Um, I think uh, you know retail has obviously been been hammered, and um, um, you know I, I think the uh, you know the, the the breaking news is that you know malls are dying and retail's dying, and Amazon's going to own everything. But the reality is there are some really high quality real estate REITs out there that um, that are continuing to grow uh, their earnings and dividends. Uh, Simon Property is a good example of that. Uh, ticker SPG, one of the largest REITs. In the in the it, that we cover, and uh, Simon has consistently been able to to grow their their FFO and their dividend year in and year out. They did cut their dividend in the last recession, but they actually paid out stock instead. So a little little bit of compensation. Some some would have preferred the dividend, but Simon has done a really great job. And their balance sheet is A rated. You know they've got a very diverse portfolio. So when you look at the pillars for 
you know, for investing, I think when you, you know, the, the, the primary two that we look at are the cost of capital, which Simon has, has exceptional cost of capital, as well as the diversification. And, and Simon has arguably the best diversification in the mall REIT space today. So I like those. I like the, I like those. And, and on the shopping center side, I would cite Kimco. They just uh, also uh, announced their year end and fourth quarter earnings. And uh, they've done extremely well. And again, these are higher quality companies. And so those are the kind of stocks that we like, recognizing the, the mispricing uh, that we're seeing in the market as it relates to retail. Another sector that I like, but you have to be cautious, is healthcare. Again, you, I mentioned earlier this senior living and the, 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 the cycle of senior, senior housing as well as skilled nursing. Um, but, but, you know, I believe that if you maintain some tactical diversification within healthcare, um, you can you can do well. I just wrote an article today on Ventas ticker VTR, which is the one of the largest healthcare REITs. Of course, they're diversified across uh, most all uh, sectors. However, what Ventas has done uh, very well is they they were able to, uh, to to manage their risk and avoid the pain of the skilled nursing space. That's when they uh, spun off Care Capital Property Trust, and they have really been focusing on more defensive healthcare sectors such as medical office buildings and life science. And so, you know, I like healthcare, but again, you got to be careful of those, you know, more dangerous sectors. You know, net lease has always been a, a favored asset class of mine. It's not, it's not an asset class that's going to always um, outperform. And currently right now it's underperforming uh, given the, um, you know, the ri- fear of rising rate environment that we're living in. A uh, number of these net lease REITs have uh, have traded off uh, year to date. I think this the uh, net lease sector is probably the third cheapest sector there is today, and um, it's really irrational in my opinion because uh, REITs have performed very very well and they've been very consistent with their earnings and dividend growth, uh, as evidenced by the latest earnings results of Realty Income last week. And so, net lease is one of those sectors, again, that I would argue would generate somewhere in the range of 10% um, total return per year. That that would be con- comprised of, of roughly a 5% dividend yield and 5% growth. Uh, and uh, the cumulative is 10% annual returns. And and so while that is not you know very glamorous for some, uh, having a very stable uh, company in the portfolio that can consistently knock down you know 5% yield and 5% uh, growth is very attractive uh, as far as I'm concerned. For our listeners that are unfamiliar with the term, could you explain to us what a net lease REIT is? Sure. So uh, when you're driving to work uh, or driving out to, your, to the grocery store, you'll pass by McDonald's and, uh, and Walgreens and a number of these freestanding properties. And so uh, I used to be, a, prior to what I do today, I was a net lease developer. I used to build stores for companies like Advance Auto Parts, and um, O'Reilly Auto Parts, Walgreens, and CVS. And so I like to tell people what a net lease really means is that you don't have to, the landlord is not responsible for what I call the three T's, and that's uh, the, the, the toilets, the taxes, or the, or the uh, trash. Um, but but it, what that really means is that the tenant is responsible for, for the three T's, for all of those necessity, all those expenses, uh, the taxes and the insurance, the management, the maintenance. Um, so for example, if you own a Walgreens drugstore net lease, then you're, you're you as the landlord were to collect a rent check and, uh, the, uh, Walgreens would be responsible for paying the taxes, insurance and maintenance, any upkeep on the property. So it's, it's a net, net, net. That's why we have the three nets. Net stands for the taxes. One net's the insurance and one net is the, the ongoing maintenance. Interesting. You also mentioned that certain REITs have been hammered as rates begin to rise. How do you expect REITs to perform in general in a rising interest rate environment? Well, when we look at history, you know, we can see how REITs have performed and they've actually performed well. You know, I think the, you know, it, what's really interesting is when when we look back at May of 2013, when the, when the, when the Fed just announced they were going to increase rates, and we saw that reaction in May of 2013. It was what I think we call taper tantrum here. And it was a pretty big sell-off. And, and a number of investors, including me, uh, took advantage of that sell-off and really started uh, positions you know, in, in the REIT space. And so now we're kind of seeing that, you know, that 
cycle, you know, we had that cycle happen, you know, time and time again. Uh, I certainly was not uh, suspecting to see, you know, the sell-off we've seen year to date with REITs uh, and the fear of rising rates. But again, I think the the fundamentals are, are strong. And again, is always recognizing that the earnings growth is really what's going to move the market uh, in in the long run. Um, I, I'm we're really maintaining obviously coverage on the REIT space, but also believing that eventually uh, the market will will understand what what REITs really do. And if you really look back at uh, really on both sides of the of the of the rate um, discussion, one of those being, you know, how are the REITs going to respond to rising rates? And remember, most of the REITs, um, you know, have been deleveraging and really focusing on um, a a um, you know fixed fixed rate balance sheet uh, going all the way back, you know, since really 2010 2011. So I think when you look at you know REITs today. I don't ex- suspect many of these companies will will see, you know, any immediate um, uh, danger as it relates to uh, rates that are increasing within their within their debt. Again, most of them have deleveraged. We've seen a number of companies that have actually uh, improved their credit profile over the last several years, and I'm anticipating another a couple several other companies perhaps will even uh, see a, a rating in the next year or so. And I'm referring to Kimco. And Ventos is those companies that are really right at the the A the, the goal line for an upgrade to an A rating. So when you look at the you know the companies that are you know considered high quality, um, you know they've really been able to to manage their their debt very well. So when you look at it on the other side, which is the tenant side, and and will these tenants be more strained uh, due to due to rising uh, debt? Well, first off, look at the shorter term leases mainly the hotel space and the self-storage space, space, you know, hotels adjust their rents overnight. So they're not really, uh, they really have, have the less, uh, the least, um, you know, impact to rising rates. Same goes for self-storage. They can adapt to a rising rate environment uh, rapidly, uh, given these are shorter term leases. So when you get out to the longer duration leases, like the net lease REITs that I mentioned, again, that's where we're part of the misconception, if you will, because you know these companies, um, they actually do have rent growth. They the, the market perceives them to be bonds. They the market perceives them to be you know long term leases that have no rent growth whatsoever. But that's part of the misconception because most of these uh, companies do grow um, their rent uh, by at least got at least uh, escalations. So for example, store capital ticker S T O R which has some of the, the highest annualized rent growth in the REIT sector, which is around two and a half percent. They're able to obviously leverage that using leverage and can get their returns up uh, to, um, you know, to closer to four to five percent without any acquisitions. Uh, and then you look at companies like Realty Income and uh, two thirds of Realty Income's growth is external, which means acquisitions. And so Realty Income just announced last week uh, one point, roughly one point five billion dollars. Think at the high end of acquisitions for 2018. So when you combine a company that can grow uh, without acquiring at say you know three to four percent, and then add to that the external lever, which in the case of Realty Income is one point five billion a year of new investments that are highly accretive. They have the lowest cost of capital in the in that sector. Um, they're able to generate you know very favorable um, growth. So I think you know where where we're seeing this mis misconnect uh, misconnection today, uh, with with especially net lease REITs is that they aren't bonds. You know this this we're not buying Walgreens or FedEx or Walmart bonds that are yielding two to three percent. You know we're buying a diversified bond portfolio that has rent growth. So you have a realty income that generates their yield is around you know five 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 point one percent somewhere in that range. And they can also generate, you know, growth of around four percent. So that's kind of how I see this market today. There's a little confusion still out there, and again, that's that's creating excellent opportunity, excellent entry opportunities for investors in the space. So short story is you'll think you think REITs will be fine even if rates rise. It's just part of the cycle. Absolutely, no question about it. You know, again, it's just uh, it's it's a irrational behavior, and that's the time when you go in and and you buy these companies and. Um, eventually, uh, you know, the fundamentals will, will, uh, prevail. And, um, you know, the last, 
uh, you know, earnings period that we've just are going through right now really validates that. We've had most of the companies that have announced very strong earnings growth for 2018. So I think that's really the best evidence we have right now. Rising rates is one of the big stories in the markets right now, with another being the recent tax reform. How do you anticipate that this tax reform will impact REIT investors? It's going to be huge. I guess full disclosure, I serve on the president's campaign advisory board. So I've been very involved really from the beginning in terms of uh, uh, President Trump's agenda, his tax reform agenda. Uh, I've, I've been involved with several people uh, close to the White House and watching this unfold. So I think uh, what, what, I, what I was not anticipating, and I don't think a lot of people were anticipating, is the positive impact to REITs, but, but also commercial real estate. So first off, you know, commercial real estate, uh, as you know, we have in the U.S. several things that that uh, have been advantageous for us. One of those being the 1031 exchange um, uh, law, which has been created almost 100 years ago. And there was some there was some skepticism over 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 whether or not that law would would change. But but uh, it did pass. There are some changes to that law, which prohibits exchanging now into, say, art or airplanes. But real estate, uh, which is really how why this law was created, uh, is 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 staying on the books, and I think that's that's huge for not only uh, individual investors but also REITs because REITs use a number of 1031s, and again these 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 1031s, uh, eventually the taxes get paid, uh, but it it is a way for a company or an individual to defer the taxes and roll and, and create more wealth by investing into a like kind uh, piece of real estate. So I think the other things that have really been beneficial is the tax, the corporate tax reform in itself. Um, there have already been hundreds and hundreds of companies that have announced they are going to redeploy their capital uh, into new machinery and new equipment and employees. And obviously, those three things need buildings. You've got to have buildings for machinery, equipment, and, and new people. And so I think you're you're already seeing a number of um, of retailers, for example, who are um, expanding their business as, re, as, re, as it relates to their beneficial um, tax reform treatment. Um, so I think that's certainly a catalyst for a number of sectors. Um, uh, and uh, I think it's going to continue from an individual perspective. We're also seeing it in, in uh, sectors such as hotels, where demand should escalate as it relates to more disposable income that's being cycled through um, the, uh, the country. And, and, and retail as well. A number of people now, a number of, number of, uh, of Americans are, are seeing now that disposable income in, t- in the terms of their tax reductions. So I think overall that's been a huge catalyst. And then I guess the last thing, which was unexpected, is that now the tax rate is now being dropped to, uh, to roughly 20% from 39%. You know, obviously will not impact someone in a, in a tax advantaged account like a 401k. But but for for family office investors or for you know high high net and wor- high net worth investors who who are um, depending on that that dividend income uh, that's a that's a huge huge um, extra that REITs are going to be treated in the same in the same uh, uh, spotlight if you will as some of their uh, closest uh, peers so I think overall I think tax reform is is very beneficial I think infrastructure which is next. Um, is going to also be beneficial to to REITs. There are a number of REITs now that have infrastructure platforms in place, and I think REITs will definitely be beneficiaries as the uh, public public private partnerships unfold. And you know, we start to see uh, evidence of the infrastructure plan unfold. Do you have any suggestions for investors who are looking to learn more about the tax reform and how it's going to impact their investment approach? Um, yeah, I've written a number of articles on that. Number one, number two. You know, NAREIT is a great source for investors, and that's the National so- Association of Real Estate Investment Trusts. So you can Google a NAREIT. Number of articles there written by some of their economists that they've done an excellent job, and they're just a great lobbying company for REITs in general. And I think that was a big reason why uh, REITs got such beneficial treatment uh, as it relates to the tax reform. Um, and those those were kind of my first my first two places. Um, but but absolutely, uh, I think you know, you know I've gone through a number of these earnings transcripts over the last couple of weeks, and no, quite a few CEOs are really talking about tax reform as a catalyst for their company, and I really think that's going to be uh, you know a good reason for for investors to really jump in uh, now, even though we're seeing this interest rate 
you know, uh, volatility, I think now is certainly a good time. And, you know, tax reform is absolutely uh, an undeniable catalyst for most of these REITs. We've talked a lot in this discussion so far about the different categorizations of REITs, whether it's mall REITs or shopping center REITs or retail REITs or healthcare REITs. Another important categorization of REITs is equity REITs versus mortgage REITs. Could you talk a little bit about the differences between the two, what the trade-offs are, and whether you prefer one class over the other? Sure. And I guess, first off, before we go into the mortgage REITs, let's let's go ahead and, and bifurcate that into the two different mortgage REITs. You have commercial mortgage REITs, which really are more like banks. They're like the, you know, the commercial banks uh, that, that, that lend money to uh, on or on. You know, commercial real estate, um, and then you have the residential re- mortgage REITs, which are higher risk, um, and because they have typically these REITs have substantially more leverage, and it's a totally different you know business model. So we tend to shy away from the mortgage REITs, the, the you know the the residential mortgage REIT space, um, because of that leverage, which because of that volatility, um, there are some preferred. We do cover the preferreds fairly broadly. And there are a number of preferreds that we do, you know, uh, like in the in the mortgage REIT space. But but all in all, I think the, uh, the the two sectors we cover really extensively are the equity REITs and then the commercial mortgage REITs. Um, and so, you know, we like we like them both. Uh, commercial mortgage REITs are really more like preferreds. Um, you know, we don't use the FFO metric because they don't own real estate. They lend money <laughs> on real estate. So again, hence the reason mortgage REIT versus equity REIT. And so, you know, typically we've seen a number of, of new companies that have come out and listed shares over the last six to 12 months. I just finished up for our Forbes newsletter, the, our mortgage REIT article. And I think we've got now 12, roughly about a dozen uh, commercial mortgage REITs in the U.S., uh, that we cover, and, um, and those are yielding anywhere from you know from probably the mid seven and a half range, uh, all the way up to maybe the ten to t- just above ten percent range. So they are higher yielding, and obviously these companies pay out about a hundred percent of their of their uh, core earnings. You know, again, they really function more like banks. And one of the biggest ways to analyze a commercial mortgage read is is credit risk. Because really, what these companies do is they manage their the credit risk within the portfolio. Uh, as they make lo- loans, they don't like defaults, and so it really boils down to how good is that company in, in, in analyzing their their underlying you know credit. On the equity REIT side, I mean, as I mentioned earlier, there are just a growing number of sectors and subsectors, uh, and you know that we cover. And that's great because, um, you know, it provides our readers and our, our investors and subscribers with access to really broader portfolio uh, management tools and really trying to find, you know, the best companies to own. One of the secrets we've we've really been successful at here over the, over the years is a portfolio we call the durable income portfolio. And the way we've modeled that portfolio is pretty simple. It's uh, I kind of call it it's the anchor and the buoy model. And what I mean by that is we anchor the portfolio with roughly 50% of REITs that that have more long-term lease attributes. So primarily, this would be net lease REITs in healthcare. Um, and those have been arguably the most predictable, um, you know, paying stocks because of those long-term leases. And and by weighting those 50%, we've kind of got a very solid anchor, and we'll even overweight. Uh, you know, that portfolio may be to closer to 60%. So that's the anchor component. The buoy component are, is basically everything else. It's the companies with shorter term leases uh, that we believe will generate, um, you know, higher returns than 10% because they have, you know, especially if we can get in there, if we could, you know, accumulate shares at the right time in the, recognizing that certain, these sectors may be out of favor for, for, for whatever reason. So, whether it be hotels, whether it be shopping centers, whether it be data center, uh, again, pretty much everything except net lease and healthcare, we try to go in with at least a 50, you know, 50% or less. That's the buoy component. And by uh, combining, you know, those, those those names, last year we generated returns of around 12.5% in the durable income portfolio. That was about 30 stocks, so we've got a pretty broad composition in the portfolio. But again, diversification is one of the best risk mitigators, and we were able to um, really, you know, find those sectors that that we could uh, we could own. And uh, you know, retail was tough. Obviously, last year it pulled everybody under, 
But uh, we were able to mitigate a lot of that retail risk because we had diversified into other sectors like industrial or like uh, cell towers and like data centers, which really outperformed in 2017. I think that's really important to, to not, you know, I tell people all the time, not just to own, you know, one REIT, five REITs or even 10 REITs, but really make a conscious decision to, to, to build a portfolio um, that's a long term, you know, portfolio, just like you would with your investors overall. Talking a little bit about portfolio management, what allocation would you recommend most people give to REITs? Is it 10 percent, 20 percent, 50 percent, or does it really depend on that individual's goals? Yeah, I think, you know, the, obviously the disclaimers there, uh, you know, each investor has his or her own risk tolerance. But I would say, you know, 10 to 15 percent. I mean, it, it, you know, it depends on what stage you are in the game. If you're just getting in today, I would even argue because we've seen this kind of irrational sell off and the quote that margin of safety in, in the market today. I would even say maybe 15 percent would be appropriate, given given what we're seeing with the fundamentals today. Uh, now, I have a much larger exposure and I tell people all the time, and this is what I do, just like, y- y- you know, your core of competence. I know mine. So I'm, I'm not all in, but I've got a fairly you know outsized uh, position in reach today. But but again, this is what I this is what I do and I should have. Um, but but for the average investor, I would I would argue, you know, 10 to 15 percent would certainly be uh, a regional comp- composition. And, and, and keep in mind, that does not include your house or your rental house. Or any, you know, uh, you know, third-party real estate. Uh, I'm referring just to to REITs in general. Talking about physical real estate, you mentioned earlier on this call that you had a previous career as a commercial real estate developer, which I did not know. I'm curious as to when you first became interested in real estate and when and why you made the transition from owning tangible real estate to investing and analyzing REITs. Sure. Well, you know, I always first of all I tell people I always try to maintain bipartisan uh, comments as it relates to investing. But I'll say the where how you asked the question, so I'm going to answer it. So when I got out of college, uh, I read this book called The Art of the Deal, and so that gives you my age. That book was published uh, quite a number of years ago, uh, about 30 years ago, and um, you know I, I remember my first job. I was sitting in a cubicle, uh, leasing space, and I, I read The Art of the Deal. It was an inspiration for me to become a developer, uh, not necessarily be like Trump, but to certainly create wealth in real estate. Um, and that was really what that original book was all about, The Art of the Deal. So, you know, I, I became a leasing agent. And a number of years later, I decided to uh, roll up my sleeves and become a developer and started with one advanced auto parts store in probably, you know, 1990. And then I built uh, close to 100 stores for advanced auto and Blockbuster and Hollywood Video and uh, a number of other single tenant properties. I found out that you could actually build a, you know, put put two or three tenants on a piece of property, uh, use the economies of scale and make more money. So I started building little shopping centers for Blockbuster Video and pay less shoes. And then I just started to add on more space because I could see the margins get better when you could add more to it and hits the shopping center platform. And I started building shopping centers for companies like Walmart and a number of grocery stores. And then I got into some industrial space and kind of touched on all the major food food groups. So you know, once you once you you know get in real estate, I guess it's part of the it's part of your 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 uh, DNA. Uh, most of my parents were were in real estate. My mother still is, and um, you know it's just a great way to to build wealth. But but I also went through some painful lessons um, right before the recession and really leading into the recession, and um, and I lost a considerable amount of money uh, as it relates to you know, poor economic conditions or bad partnerships and a number of things. And so when I came out of that, um, again, the, the recession officially ended in 2009. I started writing on Seeking Alpha in 2010. Uh, so really the last eight years, um, you know, you kind of learn from those mistakes. And, and, you know, nobody likes losing money. And so I, I try to consistently remind investors that really the number one rule is to protect principal at all costs. And so by giving, you know, by, by creating this platform and being the voice in the REIT space, you know, I hope that my, you know, my uh, service is valuable for people because, you know, I certainly want to see them succeed in real estate, uh, recognizing that REITs have something that's really unique and that, you know, use, having this, uh, as I alluded to earlier, the liquidity, the being able to, to sell shares. I couldn't sell a shopping center in 2000, 2008. There were no buyers, but, but certainly uh, REITs uh, are, are liquid. They're publicly traded, so you can, you can sell at any time. REITs have diversification, which I didn't have great diversification when I was out as a developer. 
and you don't have the transparency that you have with um, you do with public companies. So when you collectively look at the attributes of REITs, um, you know, I, I mean, I love real estate, but I think REITs offer the best of both worlds. Plus, most importantly, you get professional management. And this is why I spend a lot of time with a number of management teams, CEOs, CFOs, CIOs, uh, really to to see how they perform and how they're managing risk. Uh, those pillars that I mentioned earlier, the, the cost of capital pillar, the diversification pillar, I want to see how they're how they're able to succeed. So I think when you look at collectively all of that, I mean, REITs are certainly uh, deserve to be, you know, a, a core asset class. And I'm glad that I was able to really go through these painful losses, because if I hadn't, I probably wouldn't be doing what I'm doing today. And and by the way, I did write a book, uh, just uh, published it in uh, October 2016, just as the uh, election was winding down, uh, called The Trump Factor, uh, Unlocking the Secrets Behind uh, Trump. And um, and that was uh, that basically that book has allowed me to visit all of his properties uh, in the world and really come up with my own net asset value or NAV on, on uh, President Trump and the brand of Trump. So there's been lots of people who have questioned his net worth figures because he hasn't published his tax returns. So it sounds like your book is an authority on Trump's net worth. Would you mind giving us your figure or is that secret only for the book's readers? No, and absolutely not. It's available on Amazon, but I'll have no problem. Um, the, essentially, uh, you know, the hard assets, uh, I'll call them. So this is all the properties, the golf courses, the hotels and office buildings um, and, and other assets. Um, you know, that we had those valued at pegged at roughly six billion total, six, between just over six billion. And um, again, I mean, we looked at comparable properties on each market. So in, obviously in Manhattan, you know, we looked at uh, assets like 40 Wall Street and, and uh, his, his trophy property there uh, on Fifth Avenue. But those, we looked at those comps in, in great detail. He also is partners with, two, with a REIT called Vernado in two deals, um, one in um, Manhattan and one in San Francisco. And then, um, you know, looking at all the golf courses, I'm, I'm no expert in golf, nor am I a good golfer. Um, so I uh, was able to partner with a leading golf expert who um, who sells golf courses all over the world. And we came up with evaluations of all the you know international and domestic uh, golf courses. It's interesting that, you know, his golf courses are certainly unique to many others. Uh, they are all branded by Trump, but they are all enjoy really high, a high barrier to entry real estate attributes. So Doral, for example, which uh, President Trump acquired uh, for around $150 million, um, you know, we had substantially more equity in that deal just because of the real estate, 800 acres located you know, within a few minutes from the Miami airport. Just these types of attributes that you see, but they all really lead to one thing. They're all very high quality. Even the latest development that he opened just before Going into the White House over in Washington, D.C., the hotel, uh, I've visited the hotel throughout the construction process, uh, but looking at the location of that real estate, it's irreplaceable. And so adding up all of those pieces, you know, we arrived at around just over six billion dollars of, 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 of value after debt. And we went through every property at the debt level to see exactly uh, what debt he did have. And it was actually surprising to see the low leverage. Uh, he certainly had learned his lessons uh, from his difficult times, which was basically in the late 90s and early 2000s uh, with the casinos, a few other things, uh, investments. So now he is, you know, he has certainly uh, become a more risk averse investor, at least before he was in the White House. And so the low leverage was great to see. But the brand that the brand was a hard piece and really a hard chapter for me to write. Arguably, I mean, he was um, he was running for office. It was in the primary. I was trying to find a publisher, and uh, I think I went to at least a do- dozen publishers and, and or literary agents, and nobody really wanted to to publish a book on the va- the brand of Trump. And and what the, what what that was really suggesting is that nobody really believed he was going to win. And so um, uh, the, the the remarkable thing is I went ahead and wrote the chapter. I did find a publisher. I now self-published the book, by the way. I just have a new edition out now on Amazon. So I had to write a very, I consider, subjective chapter, uh, recognizing that he could win, he could lose. Uh, but certainly the brand was going to impact, the, you know, it was be impacted by whether he won or lost. And I remember having a conversation with with President Trump before he before he uh, uh, before he won. Uh, this was probably maybe you know, just a couple of months before he uh, before the election. 
and we were talking about the brand equity. He actually asked me uh, whether or not you know he should run for president. And I remember the res- I remember responding to him, and I said, "Well, I can tell you that the you know your real estate is going to be worth the same a year from now than it is today. Arguably, it'll be worth more because the market you know because the market cycles." Um, I said, "But your brand, you could lose it all." I said, "You know, so what you're really betting on here is if you win, your brand could be worth a lot more." But if you lose, you could wipe out any brand equity that you have generated. And and I knew what that brand equity, I knew what I was going to include because I'd come up with some with some some data, uh, quite well, quite a bit of research on the, how to value the brand of Trump. But of course, I've never valued the brand of a businessman who became the president of the United States. So I didn't have that information, but I felt compelled to go ahead and include it in the book and do the best I could. And I think if you read the chapter today, it hadn't been, it has not been edited since the original version of the book, which was published in October, 2016. Um, that chapter is the same and the brand is the same. And basically what I said is, you know, he's argued that he was worth 10 billion. I've had hard assets valued at 6 billion. I could certainly see a $4 billion number or larger especially if you look at the value of names like Ford and look at how the Ford brand has developed, or perhaps look at the Richard Branson Virgin brand, because there weren't many brands that I could really go to that I could you know, use as a direct peer group of Donald Trump and the Trump organization. But now he's in the White House. Now we've got a, you know, a, a president in the White House. Um, and so I think, you know, that's that's an interesting exercise. And I think I'm I'm writing another book now, by the way, that uh, that I'm really excited about. But um, but I think, you know, the answer your question is I gave him every bit of that 10 billion. And I think now he's in the White House. I think I certainly can prove the the you know, the brand equity of not just Donald Trump, but of the, you know, of the Trump brand and the generations and the generations and the generations of Trumps. So I think that's really the important takeaway here. Um, again, I know this has nothing to do with investing, but you know, I, again, I, and I, as I said, I try to try to bifurcate my, my political views. Um, but he is in the white house and he's doing a good job and the corporate tax plan is working. Infrastructure is working. And, you know, I think he's doing a great job. And that's one reason I serve in the capacity on his campaign advisory board today. Awesome. Well, thanks for that elaborate uh, explanation. That's really awesome. And for, uh, for someone like me who doesn't have that much knowledge about Trump's net worth, that was very interesting. I thought we could close up by asking a few more fun questions. Uh, the first one I have is, do you have any mentors who have had an outsized impact on your decision to pursue read investing and research full time? Yeah, I mean there are a number of um, of REIT CEOs. Again, before I was an analyst, I was a developer, and I built you know shopping centers for uh, and, and a lot of net lease, probably more net lease than anything. And really, two two names come to mind in the REIT space, um, and really I'd say three. One of them is Tom Lewis. Tom was the former CEO of uh, Realty Income. Today he's retired and he lives in Hawaii uh, with his wife and. Um, um, and Tom and I have, you know, I've known Tom since he was, um, you know, since I was a developer, which is a long time ago. And I used to sell stores to Realty Income. And Tom has been an excellent mentor for me because he's taught me a lot, not only in the REIT space, but really Tom, before he was at CEO of Realty Income, he, he was in, uh, worked for a company called Procter & Gamble. He knows a little bit about marketing. And really, if you look back at, at, at how at, at Tom's you know marketing capabilities at Procter Gamble and his leadership capabilities at Realty Income, and what he's been able to do when he was at the company and what Realty Income is doing now, um, I think that is uh, Tom is definitely one of the one of the best. The, the, probably the other one would be uh, Milton Cooper over at Kimco. Milton was the co-founder of Kimco. I know Milton pretty well. Um, he's still very active uh, in 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 the you know, in the REIT space. He actually is on the board of, of Getty. I didn't know that till I wrote an article on Getty yesterday. <laughs> and, uh, but he's also still obviously on the board and one of the, the largest shareholder in Kimco. 
But Milton's great and uh, just has an amazing uh, knowledge in the retail space. And I think finally is uh, Deborah Cafaro. Deborah is the CEO of Ventos, arguably one of the best CEOs uh, in the REIT sector and maybe overall um, doing a splendid job. I just wrote an article and hopefully it'll, it'll pop up here any minute on Ventos. And, um, you know, I think those three really, uh, in terms of managing risk and, and really, you know, you, leveraging those, those pillars that I mentioned, the, the cost of capital and diversification pillar, managing the capital, uh, for the best you know, interest of investors and helping investors protect their principal at all costs. I mean, those three really, to me, sum up you know, the best of the best in terms of leadership and people that I would uh, certainly mentor uh, moving forward. This next one's not necessarily about investing, but it's a question that I like asking people anyway. What's the kindest thing that anyone has ever done for you? The kindest thing? Oh, wow. Wow. Um, well, I'll say I don't know this. This may uh, this may seem a little odd, but uh, about six months ago, I was doing a uh, a, a hit on Fo- on Fox and Friends quite a bit. I was doing a, a hit on Fox and Friends, and my daughter was with me. My oldest daughter. I've got five kids. My oldest daughter works for CNBC. Her name is Lauren Thomas, and it was early in the morning, and we were. She was at the studio with me. She was going off to work. I had just finished a interview at Fox. And my daughter said, hey, I bet uh, I bet the president will tweet you. And I said to her, I said, well, you know, I, maybe I doubt it. He's too busy to tweet, um, you know, and I didn't think I did a great job, you know, on the, <laughs> you know, so I wasn't really expecting it. So a couple hours later, she goes to work. I go to work. I was uh, had a meeting in the Chrysler building and I never will forget where I was standing when I got the phone call. It wasn't a tweet. It was a phone call from the White House. And she said, can you hold for the president? And, um, you know, I had a had a great, uh, you know, 15 minute discussion with our president. So that was probably one of the kindest things. He didn't have to do it. Uh, There's a lot going on in the world than than having to call up, uh, you know, his friend. Uh, But uh, it was great to hear from him. And again, I think, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, you look back at my career at kind of where I've been in. you know, it's just been an amazing, it's been amazing to see this. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm just glad to do what I can do for investors. Like I said, I have no interest in, uh, in the, in the politics whatsoever. Uh, my main, my main job and what I do every day is I want to wake up and really help investors, um, you know, create wealth through real estate. And that's really my, my number one objective. Awesome. And this next one's more of a philosophical exercise than anything else. I know you practice a a pretty high level of diversification. So this will go against your very nature. But if you had to liquidate your own personal investment portfolio and rebalance to just five core equally weighted holdings, so 20% each, what would you own and why would you own them? You know, you was, you're saying core within the REIT space or, or, or outside of REIT space? Both. It can be some REITs or all REITs or no REITs actually. Up to you. I would say, um, you know, I would definitely diversify. I would say in the REIT because I mean, again, I, I don't know I'm not an expert in, in, you know, outside of my space. And I believe circle of competence is key. And so I would steer, you know, within that, within, if I sold off the whole port, if I sold off all 35 stocks I own today, REITs, and I sit, I went and bought five, um, I would diversify those five across sectors. And so I would have realty income again, ticker O is 20%. I would have Simon properties, SPG malls. And there is a big difference between, by the way, I just wrote the article in the days, a big difference between malls and realty income. We can, we can save that for another day, but Simon properties, realty income, Ventos, VTR, ticker VTR. Uh, that gives my healthcare exposure, my mall exposure, my net lease exposure. I would like to get a hold of data today. Um, digital may be a little pricey, but you know, for over the long term, you're fine. The company generates very consistently five, six percent annualized growth, nice dividend. So I put digital realty in there and probably would put in American Tower and that's ticker AMT. And it's funny because I if you take those those top those letters, those ticker symbols and add them up, there's three letters. And that's also the the the, the five excuse me, five letters. And those are the five letters of what I call the Davos portfolio, which is my Fang version uh, for REITs. So it's digital, American Tower, Ventos, Realty Income, that's the O, 
and Simon is the S. So I'd invest right now today. I put them in Dave Voss and and go to sleep at night. Awesome. Well, thanks so much for taking some time to talk with us today, Brad. I know I certainly learned a lot and I'm sure most of our listeners can say the same. So thanks again. You bet. Thank you. Thanks so much for listening to today's episode, everyone. I invite you to check out our website at sureinvesting.co, see our premium investment research at suredividend.com, and also check us out on YouTube where we publish videos under the name Sure Dividend. See you next time.